Hello everybody and welcome to my YouTube channel for another video on metabolic alkalosis. Metabolic alkalosis is defined as a primary increase in serum bicarbonate concentration due to the loss of the hydrogen ions and or the gain in the bicarbonate ions. And it's usually accompanied by hypokalemia and hypochloremia as you'll be seeing shortly why that is important. Now there are five main pathophysiologies or etiologies by which metabolic alkalosis occurs and they're also known as precipitating factors and those are GI hydrogen ions loss, renal hydrogen ions loss, the intracellular shift of hydrogen ions, the alkali administration and finally the contraction alkalosis however in order for metabolic alkalosis to occur we need to have one or more of those etiologies or also known as the precipitating factors along with one or more of the following maintenance factors and those maintenance factors are the following reduced effective arterial blood volume or hypokalemia or hypochloremia or renal dysfunction or hyperaldosteronism so again we need one or more of those maintenance factors along with one or more of the precipitating factors in order for metabolic alkalosis to take place and the reason is the precipitating factors are the ones that increase the serum bicarbonate concentration whereas the maintenance factors are the ones that decrease the bicarbonate excretion either by increased bicarbonate reabsorption or by the decreased loss of bicarbonate ions. For instance, the reduced effective arterial blood volume will cause increased reabsorption of sodium in the proximal convoluted tubules along with bicarbonate ions and this means decreased excretion of bicarbonate ions. In hypokalemia, there are two primary mechanisms by which hypokalemia maintains the alkalosis. The first one is that hypokalemia will activate the hydrogen potassium ATPS pump and therefore more potassium shifted out of the cells in exchange for hydrogen ions to go inside the cells and therefore this will maintain the alkalosis because the hydrogen ions are shifted into the cells and the second mechanism is that hypokalemia stimulates the hydrogen potassium ATPS pump in the luminal membrane of type A intercalated cells in the kidneys and this will reabsorb the potassium and secrete the hydrogen ions in the tubules and this will maintain the alkalosis because we are excreting the hydrogen ions. However, please note that in here we are discussing how hypokalemia maintains the metabolic alkalosis but at the same time it's very interesting to know that metabolic alkalosis itself causes hypokalemia and that's what I meant when I have read this earlier sentence and there are few mechanisms by which metabolic alkalosis causes hypokalemia with the first one being that some of the causes of metabolic alkalosis will be accompanied by volume depletion and this volume depletion will trigger hyperaldosteronism and the hyperaldosteronism will cause the hypokalemia and the second mechanism is that when you have too much bicarbonate regardless of the cause when you have too much bicarbonate concentration in the blood that will exceed the bicarbonate reabsorptive capacity in the kidneys and this will increase the delivery of the sodium bicarbonate to the distal tubules and when the sodium bicarbonate reaches the distal tubules the sodium will be reabsorbed in exchange for potassium and hydrogen ions and thus to maintain the electrical neutrality and this will result in hypokalemia now going back to our maintenance factors we have reached now the hypochloremia and hypochloremia causes increased reabsorption of bicarbonate and decreased secretion of bicarbonate ions in the distal nephron and therefore maintaining the metabolic alkalosis but at the same time the same story with hypokalemia which is that metabolic alkalosis is itself accompanied with hypochloremia as we have already said in this sentence and that's because some of the causes of metabolic alkalosis also lose the chloride ions such as vomiting or the loss of gastric secretions or the use of diuretics all of which cause chloride ions depletion and then going back to our maintenance factors and now with the renal dysfunction and you'd probably ask me the following question right now how does renal dysfunction or renal failure cause metabolic alkalosis and you have just explained in, the, in your previous video that renal failure causes metabolic acidosis and the answer is simply renal dysfunction does not cause metabolic alkalosis but it rather maintains the metabolic alkalosis as in renal failure or renal dysfunction 
reaction, you simply have lost the capacity to excrete the excess bicarbonate ions due to the decreased GFR. But if you have an isolated renal failure or renal dysfunction without the previous precipitating factor of the metabolic alkalosis, you will definitely then be having a metabolic acidosis caused by the renal dysfunction. And finally, we have the hyperaldosteronism and hyperaldosteronism will result in both hypokalemia and in increased hydrogen ions excretion in the kidneys. Perfect. Now, this is the overall introduction for metabolic alkalosis. And now let's have a look at the precipitating factors in more details, starting with the GI hydrogen loss and then the renal hydrogen loss and then the intracellular shift of the hydrogen ions and then the contraction alkalosis and ending with the alkali administration. So starting with the GI hydrogen ions loss, we have both upper GI losses and the lower GI losses. The upper GI losses are simply the gastric secretions lost through vomiting or the NG2 and it's simply because we're losing the acidic gastric contents. For the lower GI losses, however, as you recall from the metabolic acidosis video, most of the diarrhea types will cause metabolic acidosis. However, in certain situations, we could actually develop metabolic alkalosis, such as a diarrhea due to a vellus adenoma or a diarrhea due to a laxative. And that's because in these two conditions, we will be having more hypokalemia than the usual hypokalemia associated with the other types of diarrhea and this excessive hypokalemia will trigger the metabolic alkalosis. And a third condition called congenital chloride wasting diarrhea in which there's a defect in the chloride bicarbonate exchanger in the ileum and the colon and this exchanger normally absorbs chloride from the intestine and secretes bicarbonate and since it is defective in this condition you'll be having too much chloride in the stool and the bicarbonate will be retained in the body resulting in metabolic alkalosis and now moving to the renal hydrogen ions loss now firstly, in order to have an increased hydrogen ions loss in the nephron, two conditions need to be fulfilled. The first one is increased sodium and water delivered to the distal nephron and the second is increased mineralocorticoid activity. And the reason for the increased sodium and water delivery is that the sodium will be reabsorbed in the distal nephron creating a more electronegative tubular lumen which will favor both hydrogen ion secretion and potassium secretion into the lumen and the second part is the increased mineral corticoid activity because the mineral corticoids will activate both the hydrogen ATPase pump and the sodium potassium ATPase pump both which will favor hydrogen ion secretion into the lumen and we have several examples here all of which increase the renal hydrogen ions loss the first is primary mineral corticoid excess which is simply too much aldosterone along with increased sodium and water delivery to the distal nephron please note that in the secondary mineral corticoid excess we would be having volume depletion and therefore the distal water and sodium delivery will be decreased and therefore metabolic alkalosis does not occur in the secondary mineral corticoid excess except if diuretics were used in the secondary mineral corticoid excess and then we have the loops or the thiazides both of which increase aldosterone secretion and increase the distal delivery of the sodium and the water. And then we have the Barter and the Gittelman syndromes, both of which cause hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis, with Barter syndrome resembling the loop diuretics and Gittelman syndrome resembling the thiazide diuretics. And then we have the post hypercapnia, which is basically having a chronic respiratory acidosis. And in chronic respiratory acidosis, we will be having a compensatory increase in the hydrogen ions excretion through the kidneys, and therefore an increase in the serum bicarbonate level. However, the patient's pH will be somewhat normal because of the ongoing respiratory acidosis. But once this patient's acidosis is treated by mechanical ventilation or other means, there will be hypercapnia and the drop in the serum PaCO2 and therefore the pH immediately after the hypercapnia or the hyperventilation will be high causing alkalosis. And finally, we have the hypercalcemia and the milk alkali syndrome. And milk alkali syndrome is basically a triad of hypercalcemia, metabolic alkalosis, and acute kidney injury. So what happens is the patient will be ingesting lots of milk which contains calcium carbonate and vitamin D, both of which will cause hypercalcemia.
hypercalcemia and calcium carbonate of course also causing the metabolic alkalosis and this hypercalcemia that has developed does actually lots of consequences however the two most important consequences are one it causes vasoconstriction and therefore decreases the GFR which maintains the alkalosis and the second thing is that hypercalcemia causes vomiting and the vomiting will aggravate the metabolic alkalosis and will further decrease the GFR because of the hypovolemia induced and therefore metabolic alkalosis will be maintained and now let's move to the intracellular shift of the hydrogen ions and this is basically seen in hypokalemia such as in vomiting or the use of NG tubes or even mineralocorticoid excess and hypokalemia of course will cause the shift of the hydrogen ions into the cells in exchange for the potassium ions to be kicked out of the cells to maintain electron neutrality and as you recall from the previous slide this intracellular shift of the hydrogen ions due to the hypokalemia will maintain the metabolic alkalosis in several ways and most importantly is the intracellular acidosis that occurs in the renal tubular cells which will secrete the hydrogen ions into the the tubular lumen and this in turn will cause reabsorption of the bicarbonate into the blood maintaining the metabolic alkalosis and then with the fourth category which is contraction alkalosis which is basically losing large amounts of low bicarbonate fluid resulting in a higher concentration of the available bicarbonate in the plasma and this could be due to a variety of different causes such as the use of the loops or the thiazides or the sweat losses and cystic fibrosis or the congenital chloride wasting diarrhea or the loss of gastric secretions in a chloridia all of which result in contraction alkalosis and finally going to the alkali administration and it's usually due to the administration of sodium bicarbonate in lactic acidosis patients or ketoacidosis patients to counteract the acidosis however after the resolution of the metabolic acidosis not only you have a load of sodium bicarbonate to deal with but also the lactic acids and the keto acids themselves are metabolized in the body into bicarbonate as we have explained previously in one of our videos and therefore the lactic acids and the keto acids are called potential bicarbonates and then we have the citric acid or the sodium citrate which are anticoagulants used to anticoagulate the stored blood and once the blood is transfused these anticoagulants will be metabolized into sodium bicarbonate in the recipient's body and therefore resulting in metabolic alkalosis and finally even milk alkali syndrome could actually also fit under the alkali administration this is all for the causes in brief please note there are other few causes which are not mentioned in here now let's move to the management of metabolic alkalosis starting with the history taking so starting with the history taking we will be asking for the following first is any upper or lower GI losses with the upper as in vomiting or the NG tubes and the lower as in villus adenoma or the use of laxatives and then ask about any diuretics ingestion such as the loops or the thiazides and of course the GI losses and the diuretics are the most common causes of metabolic alkalosis so always ask about these two things and then ask about any non renal disease such as Barter's or Gittleman syndromes and then inquire about any sodium bicarbonate ingestion or milk intake and even ask about any fatigue or muscle cramps which could be manifestations of a concurrent hypokalemia and then with the physical examination assess first the vital signs looking for any compensatory hypoventilation trying to decrease the blood pH and of course we will discuss that in a separate video and of course have a look at the blood pressure and the heart rate looking for any hypovolemia as a result of the GI losses or the diuretics use and then look for any signs of dehydration such as the decreased skin turgor or the decreased urine output or the postural hypotension or the decreased JVP etc and then examine the patient for any muscle weakness and of course auscultate the heart looking for arrhythmias both of which could indicate hypokalemia and if necessary you may also do an ECG and finally look for any dental and skin changes as seen in the eating disorders patient especially in the young females such as bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa in which you would probably have bad dental hygiene and dental caries because of the teeth exposure to the acid reflux and look for any dorsal hand calluses as a result of inducing vomiting which is known as Russell sign and finally look for any lunugo in anorexia nervosa patients and now moving to the investigations and most importantly we need to first look at the metabolic profile assessing all the electrolytes but specifically we want to check for the potassium level and of course we will do the ABG and finally a very important test which will help us categorize our differentials 
which is the urinary chloride levels. And it is very essential because all of the etiologies of metabolic alkalosis could be categorized into either having a low urinary chloride, which is defined as less than 20 milliequivalents per liter, or a high urinary chloride, which is more than 20 milliequivalents per liter, with a low urinary chloride being mostly one of those, such as the GI losses, either upper or the lower, or a prior diuretic use, or a post-hypercapnia, and the high urinary chloride being the active diuretic use, or in hyperaldosteronism, or in the Bader and Gittelman syndromes, the alkali administration, and finally the severe hypokalemia, all of which cause high urinary chloride. And finally, reaching the treatment, we have to treat the underlying cause, just like in metabolic acidosis, and we have to correct any coexisting potassium deficits, and of course any other electrolyte abnormalities, and usually we correct it with the potassium chloride, and if necessary, we also give the potassium sparing diuretics. And finally, metabolic alkalosis could be either saline responsive or saline resistant, or also known as chloride responsive and chloride resistant. And the saline responsive metabolic alkalosis are basically all of the causes of metabolic alkalosis, except some few causes, such as the hyperaldosteronism, or the Barter and the Gittelman syndromes, or even the Cushing syndrome. So for the saline responsive metabolic alkalosis, we will be giving IV normal saline with or without carbonic anhydrase inhibitors to excrete the excess of bicarbonate through the urine if necessary. And if the patient is edematous, we will be using the potassium chloride instead of the sodium chloride, which was the normal saline, and that's to avoid any volume overload to the patient. And for the saline-resistant metabolic alkalosis, such as in hyperaldosteronism or Cushing syndrome, we would have to treat the underlying cause, which would usually be a surgical one to resect the underlying tumor, and we would consider spironolactone if needed, which is an aldosterone antagonist. Please note that this is a very summarized management plan which aims to give you an overall idea on metabolic alkalosis. Thank you very much for watching and we'll hopefully see each other again on our next video on respiratory acidosis.